Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, December 10, 2015. This is the week in charts. This week's webinar is brought to you by WebinarSoon.com. There's a webinar soon. If you have a webinar you want me to promote, uh, for now I could do that free for you on the website. So just let me know. I'll be happy to do that on WebinarSoon.com. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or I always like to say, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Not uh, much in the way of announcements today. just want to remind you that I do have the foresight and hindsight service. If you look at the sidebar, I need to clean it up a little bit. But there's a lot of good stuff in this sidebar on my website. So when you do go to the website, check that out. A lot of good uh, stuff kind of buried in there. I know it's a little... Um, it's a little busy, but I I sort of like my website, but it, I could probably use a little work, admittedly. Uh, what are we going to talk about? Well, I woke up this morning thinking, hey, you know what? It's a chart show. Let's talk about some charts. I and mean, as I've told the story before, I was in Italy, and we were we were lost, or not, not so much lost as trying to navigate uh, detours and get around uh, the massive construction that seems to always be, always be happening, I guess, throughout the world, but especially in northern Italy. And... Um, a friend of mine in the back seat, Indian, uh, born Indian, but uh, born and raised in, in uh, or raised in uh, England. He says, David, are you ready for the presentation? And since we were running late and I was nervous, I'm like, uh, geez, I don't know. Uh, I, I got a lot to cover, and I don't know if I have time to get to the charts. So he said, why not start with the charts? So I thought that's a pretty good thing to try to start with the charts. Maybe we'll do that. In fact, we'll do that today. I want to talk a little bit about volatility cycles and fake outs. We talked about this a few weeks ago, or a week or two ago, I forget. And it's a little bit more advanced concept, but it's something that I think is very valid and useful. And then uh, when we get to the charts for your stock picks, uh, just if you don't mind, wait till we get to the actual charts, the live charts, not the, the ones we're going to go through right now in the slides. And then just ask about one stock at a time. You can ask about as many stocks as you want, but just ask about a stock, put the symbol in, hit return, and then ask about another one if you like. And then that way I could uh, delete them as I go through them. All right, uh, just the charts, ma'am. So let's let's take a look at some charts. Now this is, again, a little bit more advanced, and I want to show you this um, volatility thing. Sometimes with the volatility situation, when volatility begins to drop off and you have a longer term volatility, let's say this is a longer term volatility reading and that would be your mean and 50 days is a good, uh, good day for that. And this is historical volatility or as some people call it statistical volatility. And then you have a six day reading, which obviously is going to wax and wane, but it's fairly cyclical. And as I think I may have said a long time ago, uh, the work of Nathan Berg and uh, Larry Connors, who who took a lot of Nathan Berg's work and 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 took the ball and ran with it. And then I took a lot of that work uh, and did some research on my own. Even before I was with Larry, I was doing some volatility research. And one of the things I discovered is when that volatility does compress, it expands. It tends to overshoot. But more importantly you often get a fake out move first from a low volatility situation. So if you think about it, volatility doesn't have to be that complex. You could just look at the price chart. In fact, I actually don't really plot this indicator too much. This is the six day. And I'll give you these formulas if you want versus the 50 day. So when it's way down here, you know, the volatility has dropped well below its mean, well below the average volatility. And then it does, again, tend to overshoot itself. So instead of just coming back to where it should normally be, I guess somewhere in here, it tends to overshoot to the upside when that occurs. And it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. Now, again, you just sort of need to look at the charts. You don't really have to worry too much about, about the volatility. But if I connect all the closing prices, as you can see, the closing prices are fairly close in here over this period of time. And the overall range, for that matter, which is not included or not factored in to historical volatility. Historical volatility just looks like the closing prices. doesn't matter how big the range is during the day. It just looks at the price at the end of every day, and that becomes part of the calculation. 
But the point is that when this volatility drops really low, well below 50% of the normal volatility, you know that volatility is beginning to expand. Now, it's not really that complex of a concept if you think about it, simply because traders don't really agree for long when it comes to price, okay? And when that volatility does begin to compress, compress, a new catalyst flowing into the market can really get that market moving. And as soon as the market goes one way or the other, traders are now no longer in agreement. And a lot of them quickly find themselves on the wrong side of the market. And I, and I never really thought about why this works, but I guess, it be, I guess it's because it tends, to, it tends to be an overreaction. And one thing I talked about, I guess, a week or so ago is that the first move could be a false move. So you can see this volatility began to pick up, and then the market began to try to break out of here. In fact, it made multi-week highs. It was just shy of all-time highs. Now, when that begins to happen, a lot of people start to think, oh, I better jump in in anticipation of this market going on to make new highs. And when that comes from a low volatility situation, often the first move could be a false move. And as I said a couple of weeks ago or a week ago, whenever this was, if you actually fade the move, but obviously wait for a signal, if it breaks out, it keeps breaking out, then by all means, as a trend follower, you follow it. But if you actually fade the signal, it'll test out when that low of that volatility gets taken out, the volatility, the first move, okay? So the point I'm trying to make is the first move is often a false move, okay? Now, even though it tests out, I'm no longer this micro-focused or focused on such the, such the minutia, but obviously the market has to get started somewhere. A short-term move can obviously turn into a longer-term move. I just prefer to stick with the longer-term trend or an obvious emerging trend, look for a place to get on, hopefully get that swing trade out, and then even more hopefully capture a longer-term move. And that's the ultimate goal. So I don't get too caught up in these little swing trade moves anymore. Early, early in my career, I was trying to capture every little zig and zag. But the good thing is that going through this sort of holy grail hunt and then spending some time uh, working on volatility, a considerable amount of time working on volatility, you learn things that kind of help you wrap your head around the market. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you want to rush out and trade these things, but it kind of helps you to say, well, wait a minute, Dave. I see the markets breaking out. I don't want to just rush in and jump on the bandwagon just because it's breaking out. Because, number one, I know that breakouts often fail. Number two, a volatility type of expansion like this can often fail. And number three, it will actually test out. You could actually trade this on a very short-term basis. The problem with trading something like this on such a short-term basis is that you're not going to capture that longer-term move if you're just purely a short-term trader. So don't get me wrong. I think you can only predict the short-term when it comes to markets, but you have to have some sort of plan in place that will allow you to also capture a longer-term move. In other words, you need to have limited losses and hopefully still allow for unlimited gains. If you're just trading the short term, the so-called Tlaib black swan could still be in effect. By the way, across the street, uh, Catacorna to my house, I was uh, walking the other day and I noticed that they have some black swans in their pond. So uh, hopefully none of those black swans will come to, to visit me. If you don't know what that is, uh, Google it. Is this like the NR4 and NR7 pattern or strategy? Yeah, you could go back to, um, what's his name, uh, Toby Crable. It's Toby Crable kind of stuff uh, where you're looking for that compression and volatility. And uh, Howard said NR4 means na um, narrow range 4 or narrow range 7. So, yeah, that's good stuff to study. I studied Toby Crable. To bleh, easy for me to say Toby Crable years ago, but you can see when that volatility compresses either on a range basis or, as I like to use, the, the historical volatility basis, the closing basis, then you tend to get an expansion in volatility out of that. The reason I like the historical volatility and the closing basis is because on the close, everybody's sort of in agreement, okay? Because, but during the day, 
people are jockeying for positions and markets are obviously going up and down. But you get that one fixed point at the close where everybody agrees on price, okay? And then you you take it from there. So anyway, the point I'm trying to make again is sometimes that first move out can be a false move. And so far, that's kind of played out. And I guess for all intents and purposes, this is done as far as if you were to take that Toby Crable type of trade or Natenberg type of trade or or volatility fake out stuff that I wrote about many, many years ago, I think in 95 at Stocks and Commodities, if you want to try to dig up that issue, it was a, it was called a volatility trade in gold. So that was, oh my God, I'm dating myself. That was 20 years ago I wrote that article. It's crazy. Uh, God, I'm becoming an old fart. But anyway, you could dig that out, and that's the type of stuff I talked about uh, back then. Now, so that's one of the concerns with the market. Let's just start looking at the market itself. This is a daily S&P. It doesn't have today's data in it just yet. But you can see that we did try to make it up to all-time highs in here. And then we begin to sell off a little bit. Now, if you were just looking at this part here, you could say, well, that's just a pullback. But even if you are looking at that and thinking that, oh, it's just a pullback, when we stalled short of the prior highs in here, when you get this reverse check mark, it's kind of like that gatekeeper-ish type of pattern where a market stalls short of its prior highs. And then it began to sell off again. Now, I don't want to get into wave count or anything like that, but I'm sure there's some sort of wave count that would agree when a market stalls short of its prior highs. But I'd prefer to avoid that type of analysis and just look at the charts. And yes, it's stalling short of its short-term highs, and it's stalling short of its longer-term highs. Now, it's also important to see the forests for the trees. And that's why I'd like to look at some weekly and monthly charts today. Now, I took a lot of heat because I've been prudent for the last few months. But on a net net basis, the market really hasn't gone anywhere. So I'm not going to say I'm right, but I'm not going to say I'm wrong just yet either. Okay. And I don't think there's anything wrong with being prudent. And as a trend follower, and some people call me a trend following moron, if we have an obvious trend in place and the market is headed in an obvious direction like this, it looks like that, or uh, let's put a blank screen in here. Oops, well, I didn't want to go black, but that'll work. If the market is headed like this and pulls back a little bit, then I'm going to be Mr. Bull. I'm going to be the uh, biggest bull in bull town, okay? And that's how I, I earned the nickname, Trend Falling Moron, because back in the 90s, the market was just going up, and I was just drawing these big arrows. And people had a problem with the fact that I was confusing the issue um, with facts or, or not confusing. Well, I don't want to say that. I actually own the domain. Don't confuse the issues with facts. Issue with facts and do not confuse the issue with facts. But but their point was that they were confusing the issue with facts, okay? Uh, their, their point was that, oh, the valuations are ridiculous. Uh, this is not sustainable, blah, blah, blah. And they were fighting the trend. But what did the trend do? It kept going higher and higher and higher and higher. So when a market looks like that, I'm going to be bullish. When a market looks like this, I'm going to be cautious at best, okay, and probably mostly sit on my hands as we have been doing. It, would, it, it rolls over. It looks like that in earnest. Then obviously I'm going to be short, okay. So I took a lot of heat uh, and got some nasty grams for some people. And it used to piss me off, and now it just kind of gives me fodder for these shows, and it's just wonderful uh, <laughs> to, for me to be able to talk about these things. And until this market makes it to new highs, I'm going to keep saying what I've been saying, that we should continue to be cautious. Now, I don't want to bore you too much, but if you go, you, there's an article um, in Proactive Tr Magazine. I, occasionally I, I contribute to the magazine where I do the – what they call the while I see it article. And in the article, I talked about how the market wasn't uh, firing on all eight cil cylinders. And that was a couple of weeks ago. So uh, if you need a copy of that, let me know. Maybe I could put the link on my website somewhere. Uh, maybe I'll put it on the new this week. But you can see that we did have this bow tie signal. And what I pointed out in the article is that after these weekly bow tie signals off of all time highs, 
sometimes you can have these massive moves lower. And I've, I've showed the chart a thousand times in these webinars. I don't want to bore you too much. But you can go in and check out that article for a little bit more on that. So this bow tie, this is the signal. Your trigger would have been after the pullback when it actually began to take out that pullback. Okay, so it triggered in earnest right here. And so far, what's the market done? It's gone back up. Well, that's okay. You know, not every signal is going to be perfect, but every top will have a signal. Okay, every top will have a signal, but not every signal will be a top, if that makes sense. But I think, as Greg Morris says, you have to treat or take all signals seriously because you never know what's going to happen. And again, on a weekly basis, you can see we're still stalling short of this prior high in here. And sometimes looking at these weekly and even monthly charts, can really help you to see the forests for the trees and not get too caught up in the shorter term up movement and just keep your eye out or keep your eye on what's going on longer term. Now, uh, just for S and G's, I was plotting the desk cross last couple of days to see if it was still in effect. And it is. You can see that the 50 day moving average has dropped below the 200 day moving average. Now, this is a little bit overhyped in the media. And I don't think if you bought and sold every time you had this crossing of these two moving averages, I think you would end up losing money. However, if you did have some money management in place or if all you did was stay generally short when the 50 was below the 200, stay generally long when the 50 was above the 200, I think you would do quite well. In a lot of cases, you would probably beat most money managers. Go back and look at a year like 2000 and go back and look at a year like 2008, late 2007, where you had these signals and you had bow ties and all these other signals that the market was rolling over. And then the average money manager just rode the market down. I don't want to pick on them too much because I have bad years too. And I have bad weeks and months and everything too. But I'm not going to fight it all year in a year like 2008. 2008 was actually an okay year. We didn't print money, but we made oh, low double digits if memory serves. And that's, that's pretty damn good. We beat 90-something percent of all money managers. Not because we were smarter. We were actually – Acting like what? Trade following morons. It's just following along. So the point is, once you do have a signal, and pick your favorite signal, death cross, bow tie, whatever you want, you might want to pay attention to it just in case. Because in the past, and it's been a while since we've seen such a big move, but markets have dropped as much as 80% after this death cross. So that could you could you could put in your favorite trend following signal okay and you're going to have a little lag going in but once that trend begins to ensue you could have some fairly significant moves so it pays to pay attention so this is going to have a lot of lag as i said a second ago but so far you can see it has a cross back over and again let's just go back to this other chart when it comes to something like a bow tie especially off of all-time highs, especially on a weekly basis, basis, that could signal a major top. And that major top stays in place until that gets taken out, okay? So unless this market breaks out to new highs and stays there, then I'm going to pay attention to the fact that we have a weekly signal here, okay? If I was only looking that simply to outperform 50 graded 200 and long, if it was only that simple to outperform 50 graded 200, five, yeah, but, okay, yeah, it's not that simple. You're not going to print money and, I guess, make the most money or, or beat the benchmarks to death or whatever by just looking at something simple like that. However, it can help you to keep you on the right side of the market. OK, so obviously this weekly bow tie really hadn't panned out just yet. But if you paid attention to the weekly bow tie, if you paid attention to every major weekly bow tie over the last 30 years, you would have caught every major bull at every major bear market. Now, there were some minor signals in between, meaning that they weren't coming off of all time or 
10-year lows, okay? And those weren't quite as powerful, but these major signals, you need to pay attention to them. And, yes, it's not that easy you know, just following a signal blindly or mechanically. But if you go in and look at the research that I did, I think it was – um. um What's his name? It escapes me at the second. The chart store. Um, Ron Grimes. I think it's. I'm trying to think if I got his last. Name. Ron Grice. I'm confused because Ron, um, a person named Grimes this morning was added to my Twitter <laughs> account. Uh, Ron Grice, I believe is his name. And we talked about his research a while back, what he published in the, in the AAPTA forum. And I took that ball and kind of ran with it. And it's not necessarily the mechanical systems you want to look at. But you want to look at what happens after the signal peak to trough. So you could have some pretty serious drops from whenever your signal is until it gets back up or it turns back up. So, yeah, you have to be careful in watching that uh, if you're trying to trade it mechanically. But it certainly could help you keep you keep to keep you on the right side of the market or at least keep you cautious. Now, keep in mind that I'm looking for e inefficiencies in markets. I'm not trying to trade these indexes or indices, I should say. Every now and then we'll put on an index trade just to give us a little bit of exposure to whatever side the market we want to be on, usually on the short side when the market's sort of rolling over. But for the most part, I do not trade indices, and for the most part, I do not recommend you trade indices. However, you need to pay attention to what's going on in the indices to help keep you on the right side of the market. And when on a net-net basis things aren't working out so well, meaning that the market has gone mostly sideways, then you want to be super-duper selective in your stock selection. And that's one thing I was thinking about this year, uh, about this year, I should say, recently, is that we didn't set the world on fire so far this year. In fact, I, I, I'm a little disappointed we didn't do much better than we did. But we're in the black, and that's pretty good given the nature of the market. So we've done okay, and I guess I, I, I guess it's too late or nearly too late to say year ain't over yet. But the reason we survived and the reason we did well is because we were super selective and we waited for opportunities. And the market went sideways for most of the years, you'll see. But we, instead of just trying to trade, 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 we became super duper selective. Now – Getting back to the forest for the trees, I, I published a similar chart a few weeks ago, and I, I was even more fascinated today when I was putting my charts together. This is the monthly S&P. Now, I don't want to digress too far, but as I've been saying quite a bit, since the bottom in 2009, the buy and hold crowd has once again been rewarded because the market has generally just gone up. And we've gotten shaken out a few times along the way. But that's okay. It's better to fight and run away. He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day than just to hold on blindly and then lose half of your money like you would have in 2000 and obviously 2008 bear markets. So it's okay to get out of the way, to sell first and then ask questions later. But what's fascinating is if you go back to, let's say, the run from 2011, you can see that obviously we've lost some steam in here. And this is at the S&P 500. It's even more impressive in the Russell 2000. But where are we now? 19-something, 1950-ish or whatever. And you draw a horizontal line going back. And you can see this is 2014 and almost 2013, we haven't made a whole lot of progress. When we get to the Russell, you can see we haven't made any progress. Now, let's take a quick look at the NASDAQ. This is a weekly NASDAQ. And we also had a bow tie sell signal here, too. And the market began to sell off, but then promptly turned around and went straight back up. Now, until it takes out this prior high in here with the vigor, this sell signal still remains in place. It doesn't mean you want to rush out and short right now, although if you do see an individual setup that you like, then take it. We have one short on and one long on, and that's it. Now, when you take a look at the Rusty, this is a weekly Rusty. 
it becomes a little bit more obvious. Now, keep in mind, this is the Russell 2000, and I like to look at the IWM. I like the ETF here. And it's 2000 stocks, okay? So this is a very broad-based measure of what's going on in the overall market. And you can see we had a very clean weekly bow tie here. We also had a daily bow tie and a two-day bow tie. And we talked about the two-day bow tie at length, and we had a significant move lower out of that. So when you get a chance, or just remind me when we get to the charts, I'll plot that for you and show you. But there's a couple things to glean from this. Notice that unlike the P's where you had the bow tie, the market went down, and then went straight back up, and it's stalling short of its old highs. The Russell barely climbed up to where it began to sell off from that signal on a weekly basis. So it's a lot weaker than the rest of the market. And when we look at, or I should say not the rest of the market, a lot weaker than the other major indices. And when we look at the charts here in a few minutes, the individual stocks, you're going to see that begin to play out a little bit. So, again, on a net-net basis, if you take a look at the Russell 2000, we can go all the way back to late 2013, fall of 2013 to end of 2000, 2013. You can see that we haven't made a whole lot of forward progress in a long, long time. So that's kind of an interesting uh, thing to look at. Also, I always preach about how everything works better with trend and simplify things. And I talk about how great my bow ties are, but it's like every night I get a dose of my own medicine and if you just look at the slope of the 50-day moving average, a lot of times that can help keep you on the right side of the market. And now you can see this 50-day moving average, which in this particular case would be the 50-week moving average. And that's that can really help to keep you on the right side of major bull and bear trends. Notice that the slope is positive here. And then notice it's kind of flattened out. It's still kind of positive. But at the least, you can see that market's losing momentum, just like my big curved arrow. Where is it? There it is. I showed at the S&P 500. Okay. Now, just because momentum's slowing, it doesn't mean it's the end of the trend. But you need to pay attention when that begins to happen. Maybe the market's just having the mother of all consolidations, and then we take off again. But right now, or so far at least, I think we have signals. And again, you have to take them seriously. So you had the bow tie, a little bit of a sell-off, a little bit of a retrace. But we really didn't even get past this little pullback in here. And lo and behold, as I often say, a lot of technicals often come together. Notice that that is right at the 50-week moving average, which would be a 250-day moving average on a daily chart if you want to play around with that. But again, you're going to have some lag, but keeping an eye on the slope of just that 50-week moving average can help to keep you on the right side of the market. Now, we take a look at a monthly rusty. It's a little bit more obvious, the sideways movement, obviously. You can see this is about where we were. Let's just try to draw a line as short as I can. Uh, down, uh, obviously, in 2013, and then this is where we are, obviously, now. Just connect the dots. And so you can see we haven't made a whole lot of forward progress. Now, when you start looking at some of these sectors, especially on a weekly basis, you can see that things aren't looking so great. Now, again, I said that slope of that moving average on the 50-week. Notice this is still headed higher. It's going to be a little slow to turn, but eventually if that begins to turn down, that would signal that the, the trend might be rolling over. Now, I don't sit around and wait for a moving average. I can just see that we had a thrust down here, a little bit of a pullback. That's what I call a first thrust. So you had a first thrust trigger on a weekly chart. That would have given you this leg here. Then you had a bow tie in this pullback. And that would have triggered right around here, okay? So you really had made anything off the first thrust. I'm sorry. You might have gotten a little bit off that first thrust, but so far you wouldn't have made anything or much off of the bow tie. And then again, it stalled out towards these lower highs in here. So the S&P 500 looks a little bit more like this, that reverse checkmark look. But look at this one. This is just kind of a pullback on the weekly chart and so far kind of rolling back over. Now, let's take a look at the civvies. The civvies have been sort of an area of hope. Obviously, we have this overhead supply to worry about. But the civvies did sort of start breaking out with vigor in here recently, but then they've come right back in. So you can't get too excited about an area that looks like that. And then longer term, if we pull up a weekly or a monthly chart, I can kind of see it with my mind's eye, but you can see that 
So far, you just have a big picture retrace, and then also, again, you have this overhead supply. But more importantly is the fact that we just tried to break out and came right back in, at least more importantly on a short-term basis. Now, of the areas that did get to near or at their prior highs, uh, software is a good example of that. We made it all, all the way back to brand new all-time highs, and then we began to kind of roll over from that level. So it depends on what metric you want to use. If you want to use net net, you can see that net net basis. We haven't made a much we had made much progress in quite a while, and then you can even look further back in time with this blue arrow, blue line I have drawn here to see. Now, when you start looking at something like the trannies, it becomes very scary. I'm not a huge fan of Dow theory, which suggests which suggests that the transports could help to predict the markets. And Dow theory goes back hundreds of years, or at least 100 years. And the theory there is that if the economy is doing well, the rails are moving the products around the nation. And that makes a lot of sense. And I guess in some cases you could argue that, uh, you know, my FedEx guy was here a couple of days ago delivering the book. And um, I said, hey, what you been up to? And he's like, oh, just riding around the neighborhood, you know, kind of laughing. And, uh, I mean, he's busy as heck right now. So there, there is some basis that, hey, the transports could still be a predictor of the economy. Uh, but as a general statement, I think it's more of an old school way of looking at things. However... I look at everything. So if the civvies are rolling over, and that's that's what some people argue. That's the new information highway is the civvies in the electronics or whatever you want to use to call them, as opposed to the, the older transportation. So I guess the point about the FedEx doing well or whoever being busy right now means that there is some basis in the transports performing well, and you can't completely ignore it. But my point is you can't completely ignore anything. Not that I want to rush out and follow Dow theory, but I do want to follow what's going on in the transports and fact that into my analysis. Hopefully I didn't talk in too many circles. The point is don't rush out and, and, and follow Dow theory per se, but do pay attention to what's going on in the transports and the civvies and retail and real estate and the metals and energy for that matter. Okay. But looking to the transports, we could see on a weekly basis, this is where the bow tie is working a little bit better than it is in some of those other areas. You can see we had a sharp sell-off. We retraced a little bit. And now we've kind of sold off again. And you can see from that trigger, it's still below where that trigger is. And then now here's your 50-week moving average has begun to roll over in here. So that's looking questionable at best. So for me to get excited about the transports, Especially after a weekly bow tie signal, it would have to, like the P's and everything else, would have to make new highs. Now, the question is, is Santa going to come? And everybody talks about the Santa Claus rally. And retail would be the place to look for that Santa Claus rally. And it kind of, <laughs> a little goofy in yesterday's service, but it kind of reminded me, of uh, the first Star Wars, I guess with all this hype of Star Wars and everything. But remember when uh, R2-D2 was showing a little uh, video of Princess Leia, you know, it's like, help us Obi-Wan Kenobi. And it's sort of like retail day before yesterday was, uh, was at all-time highs. Or, I'm sorry, just shy of all-time highs. And then it was sort of like our only hope. It's kind of like, okay, well, maybe retail is going to save the whole market, break out to new highs and start looking fairly well. And then what happens yesterday begins to implode. Not the end of the world, but certainly no follow through. So it's kind of like, help us, Obi-Wan, your only hope. And eh, maybe not so much. All right, Stefan, you're welcome. Have a good, uh, have a good week. See you, uh, see you next week. Okay. Now, the question is, what about the other thousands of stocks and hundreds of sectors? In fact, let's just jump into the charts 
and start looking at those. And if y'all guys, you guys want to start looking at uh, individual stocks, uh, we can start doing that now too. Uh, by the way, this is, uh, I'm going to keep leaving this in here until, um, until proven wrong or right. Okay. Not that I'm trying to look smart to be right, but I think it's a valid thing to look for. And if it doesn't work this time, then maybe next time. So notice that uh, on September 23rd, this is where we, uh, I did my first or one of my bear market updates. I think that was the first one. And those signals are still valid. So check that out on YouTube. And if you go to what's new on my website, you could uh, you could pick that up there. Okay, um, let's pull up the charts here. And what I want to do is it's kind of like, okay, what about all the other sectors and everything else? Let's just look at, since we already looked at the – the indices, let's just take a look at a few sectors that we didn't put in the uh, presentation. You can see energies have kind of just scraped bottom in here. I have to often say or, or, or bust it through that bottom. It's always darkest right before it gets more dark. And the energies have certainly continued lower in here. They tried to bottom a while back. We went after USO because it was a setup and it was a signal. But we failed miserably, but that's okay. That's what stops are for. And then now energies are kind of bottoming out again, but I wouldn't rush out and buy them just yet. Metals and mining really look like they're going to try to bottom out, but then they went on to make new lows. Gold is showing a little bit of hope in here, uh, kind of coming off its lows a little bit, kind of triple bottom looking, but I wouldn't rush out and buy it until we start seeing some follow through. So, if you look at the rest of the sectors, and let's just look at like the major bigs and see what's going on. You can see most of these sectors have stalled well short of their old highs or sideways at best, okay, at the, at the least. And most have rolled over, and a lot of them are a downtrend. So there's not a whole lot, even like the fits. Recently broke out, but now it's come back in to this prior breakout level. So just you can look through the major big charts, and it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that most areas are still in trouble. And at the best, they're just stalling short of their prior highs. So certainly not great when you're looking at that. Now, what I like to do is I like to look at all the stocks in my tradable universe. So – I sort my stocks. Again, I'll just show you real quick. I sorted by 250K volume because I don't want to look at any um, super low volume stocks because I think that's going to be meaningless as far as, uh, number one, you can't trade them, and number two, it's not going to really help you uh, in your market predictions. So let me just build this tradable universe. In fact, I'll even use this later today. So this is the actual list I'm going to be looking at after the close today. And I'm going to copy that over to my tradable universe. Yeah, keep the symbols coming. I'll, uh, I'm going to get to them in just a few minutes, promise. We'll have plenty enough time today. So let's go take a look at that tradable universe. Oops, I must have fat figured something. All right, let's try it one more time. Talk amongst yourselves. Did I highlight too many? Nope, okay, it should work now. Flag, symbols, and watch lists. All right, now we should have about 3,000 stocks if I did it right. Yeah, there you go, 2975. And what I like to do, I like to look at uh, what's making new highs first. And this is what I do every day. And then I go in and run my more specific scans. So by looking at the new highs, I get to see, okay, that's a buyout. Okay, that's a bond fund. That's a bond fund. Okay, that's a buyout. That doesn't count. That's a bond fund. Okay, this is a food stock. Okay, so some foods are up there. That's a buyout. Let's look, adore that. That's a food stock. I think it's the same as Tyson, right? So you can see that a lot of bond funds up, up here. Another bond fund, another bond fund. And not a whole lot else. Another bond fund. So when you see that another bond fund, your your new high list is mostly bond funds. Again, another bond fund. 
and not a bunch of stocks in general. That was a, that's okay. That's uh, is that an internet? Okay, that's okay. That's 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 good, right? But most of the stocks in here, again, mortgage-backed security or something, which is bonds, okay? Another bond fund. So you don't have a whole lot of exciting stocks making new highs. You had a few food stocks in here, but for the most part, not a lot of great stocks. Another bond fund, as you can see, at or near new highs. Now, if you go in and you sort these by volatility, and then maybe to save some time, we'll um, – We'll scroll down to mid-range volatility. Okay, let's get uh, let's get let's say below. Let's get to some of these more volatile stocks, but further down the list. So as we start going through these downtrend, 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 sideways, sideways, downtrend. This one looks okay. We're actually long this one. This is NK. It's kind of bottomed out here, but obviously shorter term, not so great. Okay. This looks like it might be bottoming out. That's a goal stock. That's okay. But for the most part, what's that? Downtrend, new lows, on its way to new lows, on its way to new lows. Uh, okay, but kind of sideways, sideways, sideways. Okay, now here's a stock that's breaking out. Came back in a little bit. But for the most part, downtrend, downtrend. Downtrend, downtrend, or oh, that was sideways, I should say. So you start flipping through these, and if you, after you flip through a thousand or two every day, you get a pretty good feel for what's actually going on in the market. Again, a downtrend. Now this is an uptrend, but wait a minute, this is a triple leverage ETF. So that's meaningless. In fact, what we could do is we can go in, and now I'm gonna have to make a new list, but that's okay. If we went into um, exchange traded funds, let's see, system, and we flagged all of these. Now, I leave these in my list because I like to see, uh, I like to see what's going on in all those sectors, even before I do my sector analysis. But let's take them out just so there's no confusing confusion. And I don't know, I'll just, we'll just pick another level of volatility. And you can see that most stocks are in downtrends. Now, I know it can't, um, you won't probably see this live, but maybe in the recordings it'll, it'll pick it up pretty good. And you do have a few things that are bottoming out. Like this is kind of interesting in bottoming out. It's got some overhead supply. But for the most part, sideways, downtrend, 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 sideways, downtrend, super duper downtrend. Again, you want to look for like debacle du jours. That's a bad thing. Downtrend, downtrend, sideways, downtrend. So you get the idea. So when you spend as much time as I do daily, and I recommend you do this if you have the time, or feel free to pay me to do it for you. You get a pretty good feel for what's actually going on in the market. So when you see so many stocks headed lower like this, you're like, you know what? I'm going to be super duper selective, especially since the market is stalling short of its old highs. And that was like one in an uptrend, okay? But it's also bumping up against its prior high in here. Then with today's data in here, it's imploded back to where it was. And see, I kind of see all this really quick because I've just looked at so many charts. You, after a while, it becomes second nature. Downtrend. You know, again, so you get a pretty good feel that most stocks are headed lower or sideways at best, or even if they are headed higher, they have stalled short of their prior highs. So you, you get to see a theme develop in the markets. And right now I'm seeing some gold stocks bottoming out, so maybe we could do something with those stocks soon and hopefully. But for the most part, again, I know I'm beating a dead horse here, but I just want to drive this point home how important this analysis is to give you a really good feel for what's going on in the market, okay? And this is why I can't rush out and get bullish just yet. Now, this looks okay. This is C-trip, but it's kind of wide and loose and all over the place, okay? But for the most part, and I couldn't trade it because the gaps are too big, for the most part, downtrend, downtrend, you know, most areas, again, are in downtrends. So that gives me a feel of what's happening. I did run some more specialized scans and see if I could find any setups in case I missed something 
in this first really fast pass. And then after that, obviously, I go look at the all the sectors, like we started going through those a bit ago. But I look at all 250 or whatever it is, 239 of those Morningstar industry groups. And then there's a few little ETFs thrown in here and there, like GLD is one I like to look at every day. And that's gold. And you can see that really you can't get too excited about it just yet. Okay, it did have a decent rally, but then we're kind of back to old lows, and it kind of have to look at the forest for the trees here. But our individual stock bases, or at least the gold stocks themselves, they're beginning to turn a little bit. But again, it might be a process more than an event, again, because I say that quite often. So this is what's going on in the market. Obviously, I think I've built a pretty good case uh, of the fact that it just doesn't look great at this juncture. But again, as, as a trend following moron, if all those stocks we just looked at were going up, if all those sectors we just looked at were going up or and or making new highs, and if the indices were going up and or making new highs, then I would be bullish. And, and it's hard sometimes. You have to put that ego aside. It's hard to put that ego aside, but you have to do it, especially if you're a public figure and you want to look smart. Well, look at smart making money sometimes are two different things, okay? And you can't, like, I can't get upset because someone said I was wrong, so I don't want to just chase my tail and say, okay, well, the, the market's going up. And then, of course, the market then begins to roll back over. You have to have a framework that you're going to work around, okay, and stick to it. And my framework right now, given the nature of the market, not that it will always work out like this mechanically, but we had a sell signal. Let's take a look at, like, the S&P 500. We obviously had that weekly sell signal. We obviously retraced close to new highs, but until we're actually up here at all-time highs, I'm not going to get too excited about the market because all I see is a big, wide, loose, sideways range, and I could draw, obviously, an arrow on that. Okay, let's open it up for individual stock questions. RJ is waiting for AVXL. AVXL, glad you can make it, RJ. Okay. Now, the first thing I see with this stock is that it's all over the place. It shot up from 4 to 14. What's that? About 300%, 400% round numbers. And then it lost about 80% of its value. Now, even if I didn't know anything about charts, I could look at my little statistical measurement of volatility. In other words, the historical volatility on a 50 day basis. And it says that this stock. It has an HV of 223%. Um, as a general statement, I avoid stocks that have an HV over 100. Every now and then, they might be a little uranium stock or something that's super volatile or some other type of rare earth type of stock that might be worthwhile with an HV of greater than 100. But as a general statement, Usually, if the HV is in the triple digits, what's going to happen is there's likely not going to be any structure to that market. By structure, you're looking at some sort of some sort of base, some sort of solid trend with a pullback, maybe a maybe a, a base breakout, okay, followed by a pullback or something. But if this chart looks like an electrocardiogram you probably want to avoid it. And what's going to happen most of the time is that if you do have a stock that has such a high HV, it's going to look like an electrocardiogram. And to those of you who don't know what an electrocardiogram looks like, I think I have one here. There it is. Let me zoom in a little bit on that. Okay. And as I said quite a, quite a bit, it's kind of fun when I'm speaking to a, a – a non-English speaking as a native language, at least, audience uh, through a translator. And I explain electrocardiogram and, and say that if you could hear beep, beep, beep when you hear a chart, then you uh, – kind of reminds me like the musician says, the ultimate thing is to have your songs sung back to you at a concert. Well, it's kind of fun. So I'll be in a foreign audience, and we'll look at that stocks, and I'm asking him, what do you think about this stock? And then I'll hear him in the audience start going, beep, beep, beep. And it's like, okay, you people get it. You know, that's that's my job is done. Thank you. Dave has left the building, you know. But if you look at a stock as a trend follower, and it looks a lot like a electrocardiogram, 
or worse, then it's certainly not a tradable stock. So this stock is all over the place. I would I would avoid this, RJ, uh, provided, of course, you're a trend follower. I'm assuming everyone here is a trend follower or wants to learn trend following. Now, this is an ETF. It's a leverage ETF. And the reason you want to avoid leverage ETFs is twofold, especially if you are uh, position trading. So let me see if I can get a blank screen in here and show you something with the an ETF. First of all, all ETFs have tracking errors, but the tracking error is exacerbated, and I know I'm supposed to keep it PG-13, but um, that was a joke, when you have leveraged, and then the inverted ETFs are even worse, because on the short side, it's very hard to track a market lower, and there's not enough time to get into that today. But let me just show you something what the, in addition to the tracking errors, Let's say you have a, a non-leveraged ETF, and let's just call this one, okay? Well, a leveraged ETF is going to move twice as much, so let's call this two. The distance from here to here is two. The distance from here to here is one. So if you're keeping your money management in line, you're going to buy one half as much of the leverage two-time ETF, or let's say it's three, you're going to buy one-third the amount, okay? So it's all going to wash out. Now, unless you're doing some crazy day trading in these things, which, I, you know, I, I make jokes sometimes. I say, you crazy-ass day traders, and day traders get all pissed off at me. But if you could day trade and you could do that successfully and you don't, you don't go crazy in the process of doing it and it doesn't affect you like crazy emotionally, it will affect you emotionally. That's a given. Uh, anything will affect you emotionally. And the more decisions you make, the more you're going to get uh, emotionally charged with that. And there's some actual physical things that are happening in your brain. That's why I'm kind of anti-day trading. But if you are day trading these things, and I did beat someone uh, not too long ago that, that claimed that uh, she was doing it successfully, and I have no reason to doubt her. Then, then that's fine, but if you're going to position trade these, then you need to take positions one-third the size you would normally take. And even if you're day trading, you're still going to have to take a smaller size because of the leverage involved and be super-duper careful. So I would avoid them like the plague. Now, with that said, the other thing, too, with ETFs, obviously they're going to be more efficient than individual issues. But every now and then, you'll want to, um, you might want some exposure to an area. So getting back to this dig, I don't know what's a leverage. Anybody know leverage on this? This is ultra, so I'm assuming that's leveraged. Okay, but first of all, there's no trade here anyway because you're just approaching your old lows. And let's back the chart out a little bit. And you could see that maybe it's bottoming out, but we don't trade off a double bottom, a triple bottom, or anything. We wait for that bottom to form, and then we look for what? A bow tie or a first thrust or something like that off of it. So if anything, it looks like it wants to go down and challenge its new lows here. So I would leave that alone for all of those reasons. And the reason I spent so much time on that is because uh, RJ recently emailed me about this, and I wanted to flesh it out in a lot more detail. All right, Susan, who calls me Dream Boy, because Susan says um, she dreams about me sometimes, which is kind of an inside joke if you've been coming to these shows. All right, we got Baba all marked up. Uh, Baba is a super duper thick stock. It's huge. I don't know that it, it's it's. I don't do these kind of things. I just don't have enough time. But some people do some fun stuff and say, okay, um, you know, the capitalization of Baba is bigger than uh, Intel and Walmart and Google combined, or something like that. You know, it's like those type of uh, metrics are kind of fun. I just don't have time to do them. Uh, but it's huge as far as, or as uh, Trump would say, it's huge. It's huge as far as the size of the stock. And look at the volume here. It's got a ridiculously big, huge volume. The problem with a stock that has such great volume is traders tend to cancel each other out. It doesn't mean that they can't still make inefficient moves. A market could do whatever it wants. But as a general statement, I tend to avoid thicker stocks like this. Now, Susan, if you did get long, I mean, admittedly, this looked pretty good in here. If you did get long, then stay long. But it looks like it's already bumping up against a little bit of supply here. It looks like longer term you have some issues, too, with supply. 
So if you're long, stay long. Uh, but if you're not, if you don't have a position, then I would avoid it. Okay, dig is two times. Et. Uh, thank you, Gary. Thank you, Donald, on that. Okay, so dig is two times. So if you were position trading dig, you would have to buy what? Half as much as you normally would. So why not just trade the underlying if you're doing something like that? Thomas wants to know about BYD. That's going to be a gaming stock, I believe. Now, once you make a new high and the stock begins to pull back, after it pulls back for so many days or fails to make a new high for so many days, you have to begin to ask yourself, has that stock lost momentum? It's kind of like the S&P 500. We're looking at what on a monthly basis. Um, let me just pull it up real quick. So let's take a look at a monthly chart. So it made new highs back here somewhere, but then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, you know, one year's worth of trading here where it's going sideways. So getting back to to this chart, if anything, this stock looks like it's in trouble because it's pulled back for what weeks and weeks and weeks. In fact, if you put your bow tie moving averages in, you can see it's getting ready to bow tie down. So on a bounce, it could be a short. Unfortunately, you have a lot of support below the market. So I would avoid this particular one as a short. But I'm wondering if we went to the resorts and casinos, which would probably be more fun to go to them than to trade stocks, right? Have a pretty girl bring you a drink. Uh, maybe there's something that's a, that's, that looks like it's in a little bit more trouble. This aisle looks... It's a little wide and loose, but you can see that this could be in a lot more trouble than that BYD. Okay. And let's see if there's anything else. If you're looking to short something, looks like some of these have already cracked. Almost done. There's your Boyd. Although, admittedly, it looks like it is kind of in trouble here. But it does have support below the market. So once you find a stock, this is we're kind of backing into a teachable moment here. Once you find a stock like Boyd, which is gaming, and you really like it, let's say you really like it, then there's only, what, 28 other gaming stocks or 27 if you don't count the uh, gaming overall. Then go in and look at the individual ones, okay? Is there, is there a way to brighten the background? We, we kind of go through this, uh, Timothy. Um, it might come out better in the uh, recordings um, white background kind of hurts my eyes. Some people like the white background. Um, I don't mind using it in the slides because it does come out better. But for the charts, uh, I prefer the, the black. And But you guys let me know. I mean, eventually we could probably do that. Cap is easy to put in a column. It's, it's down. It's in the fundies. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, it would take a minute to do that. But, yeah, so we could, uh, if you feel like it, Michael, uh, put, put uh, Baba in there. And compare it to um, and compare it to some big companies like IBM or whatever, and see what it is. Gary says black is beautiful. We're gonna stick with black for now, and and I'm not black. Okay, Joe likes black too. Uh, yeah, let's stick with black for now, if you guys don't mind, because it's a little easier in my eyes. Uh, I like the white because I could draw on it in the in the slides. Okay, Carol likes black too. It looks like overwhelmingly people like black, so. Uh, the dream got to be got to be a nightmare. You know about Susan? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> KBIO for Martin. KBIO. That's going to be a BIOS tech stock, I would guess. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if this is a joke or not, but obviously with a with an HV of 500, uh, this is too crazy. So this stock went up what a thousand percent, and then it pulled back about uh, 50 percent or 40 percent. So this is just way too crazy in here unless i'm wondering let's just look at something is this an old stock new stock situation let's see what we have here 11 18 now it looks like this is not a, a new stock old stock sometimes they leave old leftover data in when a new stock comes public uh you know if all i saw was this on a chart and i wasn't looking at the scaling and the the craziness of this gap and this 500 percent or thousand percent run then I would say, yeah, maybe that's pretty good. You got a nice uh, stock taken off. All right, one more vote for black. Cool. All right, we'll stick with black for now. All right, let's take a look at Pack B. 
Martin's got his biotechs on today. Let's take a look at biotech overall. Well, let's first look at this one, I guess. This one looks okay. Um, I prefer it when a stock has more than one. You really only have one big day in this trend, so to speak, this breakout. And then we've got, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine days in the pullback. So it's sort of already lost steam. I think it looks okay. I don't want to argue with it too much. But, you know, right now I'm kind of skeptical with everything. And this one, you kind of had a few big days that are breakout and a few big days. It kind of trades in chunks. I guess as long as it keeps doing that, that's fine. It be, maybe it's a, a Darvis stock, you know, or just makes a box after box. But right now, it's I think it's too many days of the pullback, and I don't like the fact that it's just one big day, and that was the that was it for the breakout. Sometimes, when you have one big day like that, it's one and done. Now I realize that it's done it more than once, but maybe this time it's one and done. Let's take a look at biotech overall, and let's take a look at the IBB first, which is the Nasdaq biotech shares. And for me to get excited about biotech, it would really have to take off, okay? Now it doesn't mean that right now I think we're we're it's setups versus the market. The market is iffy. The the most sectors are iffy. Iffy. So it, I almost put that slide in from a few months back where I showed that we just we haven't taken a whole lot of action recently, but we've had quite a few setups this year in spite of the market. And finally, the market caught up to what. Um, caught up to the internals, or, or the internals, I should say, caught up to the market. The point I'm trying to make, and believe it or not, I do have one, is that if you have a setup and you really, really like it, and the sector's not perfect, okay, and the overall market's not perfect, but you really like the setup, then by all means, take it. But when those other two are less than ideal, that setup really has to knock your socks off and you really have to like that setup and really think that that setup could trade contra or in lieu of, however you want to look at it, to the sideways or lower nature of the market and the individual sector. Ideally, you want all three pieces to fit together. If you are newer to trading, then you should only trade a stock where the stock is going up, the sector is going up, and the market's going up. If you have a little bit more experience and you're digging through those two or 3,000 stocks every night, then by all means, if you find something that looks fantastic, even though the market's a little questionable, then every now and then you go for it, okay? But again, this is not a blanket market. Like I've been saying where uh, you, you just can't randomly buy any stock right now. You've got to be super duper selective, and that's how we've been all year long, selective and patient, selective, 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 wait, wait, wait. Selective, selective, selective. And that's been a secret to this market. That's pretty much a secret to any market until you get, obviously, into a rip-roaring trend that everything works. Everything works better with trend. As I often say, don't confuse braids with a bull market. Now, the IBB, getting back before I digress too far, has done what? It's gone sideways as of late. And if we take a look at like a weekly chart, you can see that it's sold off. And so far, it's just retraced up a little bit. It's kind of bumping up against this moving average. And you also have on a weekly basis this bow tie. So this looks questionable. If I didn't know anything about charts, I would just draw a line and say, well, wait a minute. Biotech bases the IBB hasn't done anything since late 2015. Yeah, it's traded higher than lower, but on a net-net basis, it certainly lost some steam. So let's take a look at the mate, the MIG real quick on that. And we have a lot of time. I know it seems like I'm filibustering today, but we got plenty of time. So this is why I'm spending so much time on individual picks. We'll pick it up um, once we uh, get a little further into it. So let's find biotech in here. If I could find it. Here we go. So this is a weekly biotech, which is a little bit cleaner than that IBB. And again, net net basis, well, you got a pretty much a sideways market there. Shorter term, bow tie down, retrace up, kind of hit that moving average. So shorter term, biotech looks like it's in a lot of trouble. So for me to get excited about a biotech, it's really going to have to knock my socks off. I think NK is a biotech, but damn, you're long NK. Well, but it K looks pretty good. It kind of bottomed out, took off, pulled back, set up, triggered. 
So far, it's not doing much, though. Okay, so maybe you know, maybe following that overall market and overall sector is going to uh, is going to win. Maybe that the sector in the in the market is going to trump the setup in this particular case. But that's okay. All right, Kato for Phil. Never heard of it. Yeah, it's a new issue. It's lower priced. Um, well, if you're following the Dave Landry School of IPO trading, then you would know that uh, we do have a breakout pattern and then at that if it closes above a certain level, it would actually be a buy today. So based on that pattern, I would say it's a buy, but it is kind of a dangerous stock in here. Uh, because it's lower priced, moving around quite a lot. It's very speculative. Uh, if you're a, a less aggressive trader, what I would do, probably a better way of trading this one, instead of buying it on a close today, if it does close above a certain level, is wait for that first pullback. See if it can rally up or continue to rally, I should say, and then look to play the first pullback. But, yeah, it's good to have, um, it's good to have that uh, on your horizon. Yeah, the, Aaron says a rising tide lifts all ships, but uh, never forget that a falling tide sinks all ships. And so although we do like particular setups here and there, eventually I think that market, especially if it begins to sell off, as opposed to just go sideways on a net-net basis like it has for so long, then I think we're going to be in a little bit more trouble internally, at least picking stocks on the buy side. So that's the whole point I was trying to make earlier. I know I kind of went around the block a few times, but the overall market action eventually caught up to us where we saw fewer and fewer setups, and that's when I went back to saying, all right, guys, just sit on your hands. And then if you're watching the service now, like I know Aaron's a client, so he is, he's uh, he's probably bored to, to bored to tears, but that's okay. Uh, better to be on the dock wishing you were out to sea than out to sea wishing you were on the dock, right? Okay. Yep. Okay, good. We're in agreement. Bob is between PG and PG and T of Warren and way ahead of IBM. Yeah. So Bobby's Baba Baba is much is, is much bigger than uh it's like number seventeen of all stocks. I mean that's a really big stock. Ahead of Walmart, bigger than Walmart. Wow. That's incredible. Greg wants to know about LDOS. Sounds like an operating system. Well, the first thing I see with the LDOS, let me see if I can get a clean chart here, is that even though it's kind of pulled back, and, and if you're just kind of looking at the stock like this, okay, if you're just looking at that, I wonder if we can get the chart out of here. Okay, that looks pretty good. Okay, I took the I took the price bars out, and that's one of the problems. And we talked about this in the stock selection course: is that you have to train your eye to not only see the trend, but see whether or not that trend is accelerating or decelerating. Okay, so let's put the price back in, and that's the first thing I see is that now today it's doing okay, but on a net net basis, it hasn't made much forward progress given the volatility of the stock, given the price of the stock, in, in weeks, okay? So that's the only thing that would concern me about that. I, it's not a horrible-looking stock, okay? Um, I get a lot of worse. I get a lot of questions about it. Stocks look, look a lot worse. I guess the point is you could do a lot worse. But for me, I'm seeing this, this kind of breakout, then pull back to where it already broke it out from, and then again, the net net thing, it looks like it's lost a little steam. So I would hold off on that. Good Lord, Baba is 211 billion and Walmart is only 193. Billion here, billion there. After a while, it begins to add up. Pack B, did we cover that one? Yeah, we covered that one. Uh, Intel? Uh, Intel is another one of those big thick stocks. Notice the HV is at 21. Anybody know what the NASDAQ is? Let's just take a look. 16, okay? So that's a little bit lower than Intel. 
But usually in HV, when it starts getting down in the 20s, I'm not that excited about a stock unless unless it's a stock at high levels and it's a big cap stock. It's just this is a little counterintuitive, but it's just the opposite. We want just the opposite sometimes on the short side. You want a more efficient stock as a general statement on the short side, at least in the early phases of rolling over. So these big cap stocks – when they begin to roll over, or I should say if, I don't want to sound like it's a done deal, but if they begin to roll over, could provide some, some incredible shorting opportunities. And not that anything's safe, but they tend to more be to be more priced for perfection. And it's kind of like the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Whereas if, you, if, you're, if you're shorting a biotech or something like that, it might look great, and you might have a tremendous opportunity. Unfortunately, they come out with a new drug or something, then you can get in a lot of trouble really fast, okay? Or something gets approved, I should say. Uh, Intel, it's just hard for me to get excited about it. You know, shorter term, kind of sideways, and then that's a short term. Really didn't take out this prior peak in here. And then if you back it out a little bit, it looks like it's stalling short of the prior peak and just kind of all over the place. So there's not much for me to get excited about in Intel. Uh, Susan, I like that one as a short. I guess I could talk about it. <clears throat> Oh, I'm, I'm thinking of something else. Uh, but yeah, this one's been catching my eye too. Um, it's it's not quite it's not that clean just yet. But you could see that this is a stock that has lost momentum. And if you put the bow ties in, you could see you've got kind of a double bow tie or what I call the second mouse type of signal. It's a little wide and loose though. But I hear you, Susan. I think it could be in trouble. You do have a little support below the market. But this does look like a stock that's in trouble. It's just not a clean setup at this juncture. But by all means, I think that should be on your radar as a potential short. So good good job. When you're dreaming about me, you dream about that EA2. Axon, not to be confused with Axe Off. Uh, yeah, it's breaking out a little bit. That looks pretty good. Uh, volume is decent. It's still a... a it's still an IPO, a relatively new IPO. It's kind of got that Phoenix look to it. It's kind of bottomed out. You're getting to rally up a little bit. Now, I wouldn't necessarily buy it on its breakout, at least not given the nature of this market. I'm not a breakout player, although I do pay attention to breakouts and IPOs, and sometimes I might be willing to go after a breakout and an IPO, especially in a case like this where it's bottomed out significantly and beginning to rally. And the reason is, I don't want to get into too many details because it's not enough time, but if you think about an IPO pre-market, you've got the VC, you've got people who have sweat equity, and this was all covered in the IPO course, IPO course in a lot of detail, easy for me to say. But you've got all these people looking to get off the hook, and you've got a lot of fast money that's looking to become whole. And some people just need to become whole. I mean, some people might have worked for little or no wages, and they, their kids won't stop eating. I hate that. These damn kids, they just won't stop eating, you know? <laughs> so they need to get some, take some money out. And, and if they have equity in the company and this stock begins to implode, they get forced out. But once that, I call it hidden supply, once hidden because you can't see it, it's not like an overhead supply situation in a more established company. Once that hidden supply begins to work its way out of the market, OK, by a stock dropping like this, like by an IPO, I call it like the Phoenix IPO situation. So, yeah, you could probably do a lot worse than trading a breakout in this IPO. So that looks pretty good. Maybe let it continue to break out and do a pullback would be a little safer. I know, haha, -ha, way of trading it. But it certainly is something that needs to be on your radar. Absolutely. VIX, like the VIX fix. <clears throat> It's not coming up. You want to do VIX? I think it's VIX XX or VIX X. Nope. No, we'll find it. Be careful of all those uh, VIX things, by the way. V v v VXX. Okay. Yeah. Let's look at the let's look at the pure VIX first, and then you got to be really careful. Um, Larry McMillan does a wonderful speech on all of these. They changed the symbol. It used to be VIX.X. He used to do a wonderful speech, or he still does, on, on all the different VIX indexes. 
And a lot of those VIX indexes are based on futures. And if you do watch CNBC, they say a lot of wrong things on CNBC about those. So be careful if you're using CNBC to learn about the VIX. Uh, see how these are based on futures? you got to be really careful with those. I haven't looked at the VIX much lately. I usually only look at the VIX when – the VIX only matters when it matters. It's been so long they changed the symbol on me. Yeah, this is short-term futures, VIX X. But anyway, he does a really good speech on those. And, and if you don't, you really need to understand the underlying instrument. And you really need to understand that futures have a decay to them. And you're not necessarily getting what you think. Why would they change the symbol on me? Okay, we can look at anything you want. But the VIX XX, the VXX, I should say, is going to be uh, based on futures. And that's not going to give you the hedge or the leverage that you might think it will. So be super careful with that. Uh, the VIX is a reversion to the mead market. So do not try to use standard technical analysis. That's kind of a blanket statement. Um, there are some things you could use. But if you are going to try to trade something like the VIX, which at this point in time, I would recommend you not try to do. But... Um, I have some VIX systems out there from many years ago, which were in my first book. Do something like look to trade reversion to the mean. Reversion to the mean works a lot better in the VIX than it does in other markets because volatility is a mean reverting type of market. So if that VIX is extreme, look for it to implode. If that VIX is low, look for it to take off. And then you could use a moving average, and that's what those systems are based on, using a moving average. I can't believe they took the VIX out of my uh, TC. Yeah, it used to be VIX.x. Where is it? There it is. Okay, this is what we should be looking at for VIX. Now, don't worry about the absolute levels Again, you need to see it as a reversion to the mean market. Obviously, when the market began to implode, this VIX skyrocketed. Okay? But often it begins to implode right after it skyrockets. So right now the VIX is pretty low. That would have me a little bit concerned about this market. And uh, if, it, if it were to get stretched too far below its moving average, that would mean that we could be in a situation where we could see a sell-off. Um, I'm not as big a fan of the VIX as I used to be. I don't use it in my timing that much. Again, it only matters when it matters. That's why I had such a hard time pulling it up today. Um, I don't think the VIX is saying anything just yet. If it gets stretched away from that moving average or the moving averages, then I would say that we could be in a situation where you could see a reversal back to the upside of the overall market. But right now, there's nothing to really glean from it at this uh Juncture. Andre says the Chinese economy surpassed U.S. last year. Worth watching for clues. Um, I'm not a really big fan of, of following the foreign markets for clues. I still think the, the U.S. is um, I just prefer to focus on the U.S. But I mean, you do bring up an interesting point because I've always said with not trying to predict the U.S. off of other markets. Just use the U.S. to predict U.S. In fact, I pretty much believe that for all markets. If you want to look at the Hang Seng, use the Hang Seng to predict the Hang Seng. If you want to use the um, S&P 500, use the S&P 500 to predict the S&P 500. Um, I'll ask the Chinese. I'm going to Hong Kong here in, in um, about a month or so, a month and a half. So maybe I'll ask them over there how it's going. But um, – I wouldn't get into global macroeconomics. I think that's where you can get into a lot of trouble. But if you did want to look at an index or something, what's a good Chinese index? Is, is the Hang Seng pretty much the best one? I did. Um, I just did some charts with the Hang Seng. Hang, H -A, Hang. There it is. That's just the Hong Kong index. That's I was using that because we're headed to Hong Kong. By we, I mean me. Um, and my point here is that you still have a major weekly bow tie signal in place like the S&P 500. And you can see so far it's, it's kind of rolled back over after the retrace. Uh, what's the other China? There's a bunch of China indexes and China funds. That, 
let's see, uh, China, oh, uh, GXC, okay, that'll work. Um, so the point is like, okay, Andre says China surpassed the U.S., should we watch China? as far as economy is, not necessarily, but as I said earlier, watch everything, okay? Uh, earlier this year, I was getting a lot of Chinese stocks showing up in spite of our market, so we were trading some Chinese stocks, okay? And, and uh, I think some of them worked out okay. So you let the database tell you what to do, whether it's Chinese stocks, American stocks, or no stocks, okay, at all. But looking at this, you can see short term we're rolling back over it here, although we did kind of bottom out a little bit. But I would take a look at your major signals and like the Hang Seng, it still looks questionable at best. You can see retrace on a weekly basis rolling back over. You had a first thrust here, okay, and then you had a new leg, and then you pull back a little bit. It looks like another new leg. Shorter term, yeah, it's kind of bottomed out, but then what happened? It rolled right back over. So I would I would say it's still in trouble. FXI is uh, what is that? That's uh, yeah, that's China. Same sort of action going on there too. It, you can see it looks like it wants to come down to old lows. So uh, is that saying we're in trouble? I don't know, but it's certainly not a positive if you kind of factor it all in. SSCECX SS. Thank you guys for the symbols. You know it's it's hard for me to. It's funny when I'm Doing my own, like if I tried to pull the VIX on my own, I could pull it right up. But in these chart shows, it's a lot harder. This is Shanghai composite, mostly sideways, kind of rolling over shorter term. Forest for the trees analysis, uh, first thrust, thrust, pull back, and then, you know, looks like it wants to make another leg lower too. Susan wants a short Goldman Sachs. Yeah, I know about uh, – Craig says, I hate to confuse the issue, but there's a lot, hell of a lot of currency nonsense going on. Yeah, I know. I get uh, – <laughs> I got stopped out of position yesterday at a bunch of nonsense. Uh, Goldman Sachs is a short – well, I think it's in trouble longer term. You've got a lot of support going way back from years past. Um, it's not really set up right now. It's like I prefer to try to catch that first leg out, but um, – yeah, it's in trouble. I just don't think it's a setup and worth trying to go after as a short. GXC, I think, is another Chinese stock. Thank you guys for that. And girls. Yeah, we looked at that one. Thank you. SSEC. Yeah, we looked at that. Win for Joe. That's going to be another casino, right? Okay. Now, it's bottoming out. But net net, you can see it's pretty much sideways for quite a while. So let it bottom out. I do see a little uh, overhead supply here, so it depends on where it sets up. You know, maybe from here, somewhere in here, if it could set up in here to here, is okay uh, for a trade. But for now, I would leave it alone and wait for a setup. <laughs> Another solid webinar. Thank you, Dave. You're welcome, Jim. He recently bought his own stock. Who bought his own stock? When? Oh, well, good for him. Yeah, I mean, you know, that makes a lot of sense if you think about it. Uh, who was it once said? Uh, was it Peter Lynch or some? somebody said? Or uh, whoever. The only reason that an insider would ever – inside a cell for a lot of reasons. They might be putting a kid through college. They might have tripped and stuck something somewhere they shouldn't have. If you catch my drift and they lost half of their money and they have to sell some money to raise some money, but they only buy for one reason. They only buy because they think their stock is going up. So that's a very logical argument, but there's some flawed things in that too. I mean, let me interview myself. Is that a positive or negative? Yeah, it's a positive because the guy thinks it's going up. But the negative is, is or, or the flip side of way of looking at it is that he still could be wrong. I, I've known – I've never met a negative company insider. I've, I had um, some, some distant relatives 
who were insiders at in companies, and when I would plot their companies and see that they were headed lower, I would tell them, hey, it looks like your company's headed lower. And what do they say? No, but we've got this and we've got that. They're always going to be positive as a general statement. So you got to be careful in that, that if the market decides it's going down, it doesn't matter what they're doing, okay? They're going to go down with it. Boyd, I think we looked at that one, didn't we, BYD? Yeah, we looked at that one. Okay, thank you, Phil. LMAT for Phil. How are things in England today, Mr. Phil? Uh, it's shaping up. It's a little bit on the thin side. Uh, but I hear you. It looks like a pretty good stock, or I almost said a gross stock. I guess it's a gross stock. Um, it broke out. It came all the way back into its breakout. Now it's trying to hit new highs again. Put this on your momentum list. It would have to break out and then pull back again for me to get excited about it. Uh, the other thing to realize, too, is that it is a little bit on the thin side, so just be careful with that one. Okay, Paul said CBR3 uh, gave a signal. Okay, gotcha. A buy signal? Yeah, but it's... Um, it's not really that stretch, but I hear you. NVCR. All right, looks like we're kind of going to lightning round. Uh, yeah, put this on your watch list. It's it's really thin. It is an IPO. Um, for me to get excited about this one at this juncture, it would have to make new highs and then pull back. But, yeah, absolutely. And I've been watching all these IPOs for what it's worth. Gary says T206 could give you short-term direction. I can use some direction. Oh, that's McCullough Oscillator. I actually don't use it, but, you know, it's kind of like funny. I know all these guys, and um, it's like Bollinger Bands. I don't use Bo Bollinger Bands, but I get wisdom from Bollinger sometimes. Uh, I get Willem wisdom from uh, Tom McClellan, but I don't use the McClellan Oscillator. So years ago, I, 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 I did find something with McClellan Oscillator. I may have put that in the first book, but I no longer use it. Oh, you're going to hate this one? No, no. I I, I invested in Swiss, Smith & Wesson as far as you know, or maybe not, recently. Uh, yeah, no, I'm not going to hate it. Um, I don't want to confuse the issue with facts, but now it's beginning to shape up. This has always been a bit of a choppy stock, okay? Uh, I was at a gun store yesterday, and it was packed. It was the first time or second time, I think, maybe in my life I've been in a gun store. And not that I want to be man on the streets or see that as a microcosm of what's going on, but uh, people are people are a little uh, nutting up a little bit about what's happening right now in the United States. And um, you know, I'm I'm from the South. We're always heavily armed. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's beginning to see it 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 based it here for a long, long time. Now it's breaking out, so I want to pull back. You know, this one's on my radar. I, I, I'm not hating it. I'm not hating it, Craig, at all. And it's not on my radar uh, because I'm heavily armed, or you know, technically I don't have any guns. If you must know, I don't have any guns at all. I'm, I'm anti-guns, <clears throat> but don't show up in the middle of the night to, to take a look. <laughs> I would recommend you not do that. Uh, but yeah, this stock, this stock has gotten its act together. Because it based and I broke out. So you first pull back, you know, write that down. That's going to be worth a shot. If you're on the service, which you are, Craig, you're going to see this, uh, as you know, I think you know you're, you're on. Uh, you're going to see the stock set up, and you might actually see me recommend this in the near future. Not because of, um, you know, what's going on in, in a nation, but because it looks like a good setup. TXMD. TXMD. Uh, you just got the one big gap in its breakout and it's kind of all over its place, all over the place longer term. So I don't see any structure here, but yeah, put that in, on your momentum list if you want. M Macy's went down stock buybacks. Uh, okay. I can't click on the link. Unfortunately, I, I wish they had that capability. Don't not be about Ruger, RGR. RGR might be another one. I like, uh, I'm kind of a fan of the Smith products. Um, 
Yeah, Ruger Ruger's not Smith looks a lot better than Ruger uh looks. But yes, on a pullback, absolutely. Too late for cat. Uh yeah, to short cat, it's too late for cat. Um and it's kind of a choppy stock. It's kind of big and thick and choppy, but yeah, it's too late to short that one, I think. Dog. Was that a joke? <laughs> Yo, but see, see, this is the inverted chairs. Look what inverted chairs usually do. So what you want to do, if you, if you open up a hedge fund and they let you, I don't know if they even let you short these things, but open up a hedge fund and then just short, um, Short inverted shares. Don't worry about where the market's headed. And the natural decay, as you can see, will really help you out. Don't buy these things because you think they're low because they reverse. They'll, they will reverse split you to death. If you don't know what I, what I mean by that, buy them, and then you will after a few months. All right, we're going to have to wrap it up really soon. KTOV, is that the right symbol? KTOV. <coughs> Well, it's a little thin. It's obviously an IPO. Yeah, we talked about this one already. Yeah. Okay. All right, any more? Thank, that will be, thanks, we'll be framing of you. We'll be framing of you. Dreaming. <laughs> I was about to say, that's kind of interesting. Uh, did we talk about that TXMD? Uh, I'm trying to clean up the list here. Yeah, we talked about that one, AMBA. Okay. Um, no, see, this one's not quite bottomed out yet. Um, but I hear you. It's trying to bottom out. Let's. Uh, the thing is, it's coming off of, like, two-year lows. I prefer we're coming off of, like, major, major lows, like, way down here. So it, it, it's okay, but I think I'd pass for now. Okay, uh, G-Pro, and we'll have to wrap things up, G-P-R-O. Uh, well, anybody could help me draw an arrow on this. Let's just draw an arrow. Yeah, so you definitely don't want to be buying GoPro right now because it's headed lower. GoPro goes by AMBA. Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, looks like we're out of time. I, geez, thank you guys and girls so much for uh, showing up today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I'm humbled. By your appearance, obviously, I love doing these shows. If you can't tell by my enthusiasm, I am enthused, and I'm I'm so impressed that you guys and girls would show up to uh, to listen to me. So hopefully, um, hopefully, I made it worth your while. Uh, any questions? Shoot me an email, David Dave Landry .com. If we don't talk between now and then, I guess I'll see everyone uh, next Thursday. Thank you so much.